Welcome everyone. I'm Becca. I'm one of the school programs coordinators here at the Tar Pits and welcome to our first virtual educator workshop. We're so excited to have you all here and still be able to connect with you and help you continue your learning and um, transition into this world of distance learning and virtual classrooms. Uh, I'm joined today by Rachel Fiddler, our manager of school and teacher programs at the Librea Tar Pits and the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, and off screen by my co-school programs coordinator, um, Agnes Novi. And a uh, big shout out to our Natural History Museum school programs team who are watching in our audience and our other NHM colleagues. Hi, everyone. Thanks for your support. Um, so let's see, we're gonna cover a couple of quick things before we get really into all the good stuff. Um, this webinar is gonna be about an hour long. It's recorded right now and it will be posted to the Natural History Museum's YouTube page once it's finished. Um, you're also going to receive it in an email. Um, you'll get a follow-up email with a sample lesson plan for grade six through 12th, um, and activity detailed instructions for an activity of building your own shadow puppet, and also links to all the videos featured in the presentation and a certificate of completion. Um, the agenda for today, as you can see here, we're gonna do our intros. We've got about a 20 minute presentation just about the history of shadow puppets and puppets at the tar pits. Um, we're gonna have about five to 10 minutes of puppet construction tips. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the NGSS and Common Core connections. And then we'll have a Q&A, um, the last 10 minutes or so for Q&A. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go to my next slide here, maybe. There we go. So we've got a quick poll here just to get everybody warmed up. I'm gonna launch that right now. So if you could eat only one of the following for the rest of your life, which would you choose? And then also, why did you decide to join today's virtual educator workshop? Um, if you don't see any responses in here that you agree with, you can put that in the chat box. Let's see, we've got some pasta levers here. I wrote that question. <laughs> That's definitely my response. Um, and some, a lot of people wanting to learn more about education and puppetry here at the museum, which is fantastic. Uh, I'll share these results in just a bit. Um, give you another few seconds to respond. Only one person wants chocolate for the rest of their life. Oh, now we're at two. Okay. That's, that's surprising. All right. I'm going to end this poll and share it with you. Tacos, number one. All right. And we want to learn a lot about puppetry and education at the museum. So fantastic. Thank you all for that. I'm going to close that out. Um, so go ahead and introduce yourselves. We'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Um, in the chat box, you should see a little icon that looks like that little chat window. Just include your name, where you're joining us from, what subject and grades you teach, or maybe you're uh, a parent new to supporting your child's learning at home. We'd love to hear about that as well. Um, and if you've taken this workshop before, you know it's actually a three-hour workshop. Um, you'll be familiar with our presenters today who are joining us from their homes and workshops. We've got Eli Presser and Emily Franz. Eli is our technical supervisor at the museum. Emily is our theatrical technician. And I will go ahead and mute myself and allow you to take over Eli and Emily. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so uh, just to get started, I'm Eli Presser. I'm technical supervisor at our uh, performing arts program at the museum. Um, my, uh, my, mostly what we do there is we, uh, we work at uh, looking at different intersections between the arts and sciences and how we can best represent uh, exhibits at the museum through the arts uh, and uh, through, you know, offering workshops like this and then also uh, live performances. Uh, and then uh, Emily, if you want to say a bit about yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Emily Franz, and uh, I'm a theatrical technician at the Natural History Museum and the Tar Pits. Um, and I build set pieces and props uh, and work on the puppets that we use at the museums. Great. Uh, all right, so um, today, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what we do at the museum and uh, what my 
thinking today was that usually we go through uh, largely a fabrication exercise. So we teach everyone how to build puppets and we talk a little bit um, about what you might want to do with that. I thought under these circumstances, it might be interested, interesting to uh, have more of an open dialogue between ourselves and all of you on how we can integrate, uh, in this case, shadow puppetry into any subject in education. Um, I think, you know, often we'll think of uh, puppetry and in this case, shadow puppetry as being something that, you know, can only exist in a form, I guess, where we're, you know, where we're making a performance, we're making art about, about this thing, instead of looking at it as being a, a, a useful method for, uh, for actually, I think, delving into the comprehension of these ideas and breaking them, uh, breaking them down uh, with a student. Um, and we'll get more into those ideas in a second, but before we get there, I just wanted to give a very, very general idea of the different forms of shadow puppetry that exist. There's many more than what we're going to go over right now. Uh, but just, just understand that, you know, when we talk about shadow puppetry, we're not just talking about a traditional form. We're not just talking about a, a form of uh, uh, telling stories of mythology, for example. But there's really a wide variety of ways that people have used this uh, medium. Uh, to uh, tell story. Uh, so if we can start on the first slide. Um, first, oh, right, before we get there, sorry. Uh, this is what we do, one of the things we do at the museum. So uh, we have shows both at the Natural History Museum with our dinosaur encounters shows. And then at the Tar Pits, we have Ice Age encounters. This is a saber tooth cat puppet that was built by the Henson Company. Uh, it is animatronic. There's a live performer inside of it, and then we have a radio control, like what you'd use for a remote control car or something like that. Uh, Operating head, you can see that its mouth is moving, its eyes move, uh, and we create shows uh, talking about themes at the uh, tar pits using this puppet and a few others. And she's very pretty. Uh, we can go on to the next. Uh, so here we have our first uh, shadow puppet form. This is a, a Karagos, uh, a, uh, originally a Turkish form that then moved into Greece as well, uh, early traditional shadow puppet form. Uh, these puppets are all made out of leather. A lot of puppets you'll see, a lot of the early puppets are made out of uh, thin strips of leather that are then dyed or painted. Uh, Karagos also connects with a lot of other forms of puppetry. Uh, uh, historically, you can look at the uh, uh, Punch and Judy, if you're familiar with uh, Mr. Punch, Punchinella uh, from uh, the uh, Commedia dell'arte. Uh, there's also uh, the uh, German uh, Kasperi, uh, Kasperi. Um, and these are all, all of these forms were used frequently as a subversive form. You talk about uh, uh, people in power and the sort of everyman character in the form of uh, Karagos, uh, Punch, etc., moving through the different strata of society. Uh, next, we have the Tholu uh, Bamalada Theater. This comes from a state in India. All of the, uh, there are many, many different uh, shadow puppet traditions in India. Uh, this one in particular comes uh, from the uh, state of uh, Andhra Pradesh. These are also, again, leather puppets. Uh, these ones are very large scale. Uh, they share a lot in uh, construction and method. Uh, with uh, Wei and Kulit, which unfortunately probably the best way, uh, most of us, you know, the most uh, prevalent way that we see the Wei and Kulit puppets, which are from Java and Bali, are in places like Cost Plus. They've become part of a uh, decorative arts, uh, a part of decorative arts for sure in the U.S. Um, uh, but uh, if, uh, do we, did we have the animation of them? Yeah, we can move on. Um, so these are, uh, these are <laughs> sorry about that. They, uh, it's okay. We don't need to show that one uh, uh, with volume. Uh, we can move on to this. This is the uh, Chat Noir Theater in Paris. Uh, this was running in the uh, late 1800s, 1887 through 1879. Um, uh, this was a uh, cabaret in Paris that uh, had a permanent shadow theater uh, built into it. If any of you ever seen uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, the Coppola film, uh, there are shadow puppet scenes throughout that that were inspired by the theater. Uh, you can see the style of the puppets themselves on the next slide. 
uh, when we get a chance. Um, so if we can go on to the next slide. So here, the, this style of puppet. So these, you know, puppets didn't have uh, so many moving parts. A lot of times I think we think of a shadow puppet as being something with rods that a person's moving around. In this case, a lot of what they were doing were building tableaus with a lot of depth. So you can see that these have slots on them. They all uh, would slot in, uh, would kind of run on tracks. And then by putting those tracks further and further back on the screen, you create a sense of depth. Uh, uh, also very beautiful. Uh, move on to the next one. This is the Etienne Gaspard Robertson Roberts Phantasmagoria shows. Um, these were done, this was, you know, these performances were happening at the same time that uh, mentalism was very popular in theosophy, and they were creating illusions of contacting, you know, the other world of uh, ghosts using a uh, device that he, that uh, uh, Robertson uh, referred to as the Phantoscope. It was a style of pre-cinematic uh, viewing device, a uh, magic lantern, uh, so an uh, early projector. And he would create projections either on screens, like you see in this image, or within smoke itself. I think we have an image next of that device. Here's the Phantoscope on the left, and you can see some uh, a, uh, etching of, of ghosts hovering above the audience. Uh, there. Uh, so it's another, and, and that all sort of falls into the same territory of uh, shadow theater and shadow projection uh, being used uh, uh, both for storytelling and in this case to create an illusion for a larger performance. Um, we can move on next to uh, Lotto Reiniger. Lotto Reiniger was a uh, early, early filmmaker. Uh, some see her as being the progenitor of narrative animation. So when you think of Disneyland, uh, Disney's work, um, this, this really is where a lot of that began. She started looking at shadow puppets uh, as film was being developed and created a style of stop motion animation uh, that up till that point had really been just used to create very simple visual effects. And she started looking at how she could tell a longer story. Um, you, she, uh, her, one of the best known films she created was something called, uh, a film called The Adventures of Prince Ahmed. Um, Let's see if we can get like a quick video of some of her work. Um. So, right, she was taking these shadow silhouettes and uh, animating them frame by frame. This leads into uh, this really is one of the first, this is how we get from puppetry into animation. Uh, the two forms are very closely related. I, I, would, I would say that you can really look at animation as being a form that came out of especially shadow puppetry. Um, here we have an image now, so now we're in the modern era. Uh, we have a, 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 a contemporary uh, puppet company called Manual Cinema. This is an image from one of their shows. They use overhead projectors. My, uh, uh, when I think of overhead projectors, and a lot of the work I did with overhead projectors were when I was uh, going to school, and uh, when I was in high school, uh, working with overhead projectors uh, that we had, it was sort of the, as they were being phased out. Um, they use multiple overhead projectors. You can see in this next slide, they'll have usually three to four, and by layering the images they create, they can create very beautiful uh, and cinematic imagery using overhead projectors. Uh, and then finally, another thing that's been going on in shadow puppetry recently is, and we can skip through this one, uh, is the anaglyphic shadow theater. This is work that I'm showing right now from Christine Marie. Uh, she is creating 3D uh, shadow puppetry using a uh, blue and red light next to each other. And uh, if you wear anaglyphic glasses, those are like the classic 3D uh, glasses with the red and blue lens you can create a three-dimensional effect. Of course, here, when we watch the, when we see her imagery right now, it's red and blue, we get the glasses on, it becomes a single uh, darker shadow image. Um, if we can play that for a second, uh, uh, a, a lot of work that's involved using puppets with uh, objects. Thinking of this work, it doesn't necessarily just have to be about a small puppet object. Throwing, having a person in front of a projection can be very interesting too. 
You can also, uh, for example, make a shadow cutout that you use as a costuming element. So if you wanted to create a mask in shadow, you could add one of the, that to one of those figures to change their shapes a little bit. Um, that's, the, that's a sort of very quick, very basic overview of uh, different things happening and that have happened in shadow puppetry. Um, what I'd like to talk about today, well, oh, let's move on to a quotation really quick that I, that I love. Uh, where is it? It's hiding somewhere from us. I can tell it to you right now anyways. Uh, there's a puppeteer named Eric Bass. He worked uh, in New York with the Open Eye Theater uh, and worked at that time very closely with uh, Joseph Campbell, uh, who studied uh, comparative mythology, wrote on uh, comparative mythology and comparative religion. Uh, and a lot of that comes through in Eric Bass's work. Uh, in this quote, he says, I am eternally moved to expression by the natural world particularly the ocean and microorganisms, ghost stories and the unknowable, death, transformational processes, poetry, and the challenges of expressing the seemingly inexpressible. Common vocabularies such as gesture and music, folk traditions and mythology, and beauty and or humor in the profane. I am also strongly moved to examine notions of narrative, in particular, the ways in which economy of imagery, text, and movement can give a viewer just enough information to produce their own story about what they're seeing that makes sense and is a unique to them without imposing a concrete narrative. I like to exist in that enormous, amorphous world between the completely abstract and the linear and straightforward. I think this is a really great place to approach puppetry and puppetry in education. Uh, I think when we look at puppetry and theater, uh, well, we'll start with puppetry. Uh, at its root, puppetry is about creating an illusion of agency, either in a living thing or in an object, creating the idea that, that object is moving through space, physical space. Uh, if we're talking about a living thing, you can look at it and say that no, nearly in every case, a puppet is going to be less capable of doing what we are trying to mimic than the original, right? A human being has incredibly complex mechanisms in their body, and a puppet's mechanisms is, are always going to be inferior. What that lets us do when we're looking at that is take a look at what the most important aspects of that animal, in this case a human is, or that idea. We have to break it down to what are the core movements that will get across an idea, what are the core images that will get across an idea on any subject. Same with theater. Looking at the narrative structure of theater as applied to any subject allows us to break that down. Uh, and I think that breakdown can really help us deconstruct and comprehend an idea. Um, whether that be in the sciences, in mathematics, uh, in history, looking at that structure and looking at how you can have a student take an idea and, for example, break it down into five images. What are the five most important images to communicate? To, uh, to communicate your, your ideas on a subject or to, uh, to express that idea to another person. Um, in puppetry especially, we look at creating this economy of imagery and using an economy of text, again, because those puppets are not necessarily capable of doing everything we want. So we choose what parts of, what parts of the puppet are important, what images we wanna create, and we build those puppets to accomplish that. Um, and I think that really allows us to, you know, synthesize those ideas and bring them into one understandable idea. Um, at this point, I was hoping that if any of you, this is, it's, it's too bad that we can't all be speaking, but if any of you have any thoughts on this that you'd like to uh, talk about, uh, any ideas of how just with this very basic overview, you could imagine yourself incorporating this into uh, coursework, uh, or if you have any questions for uh, me or for Emily on puppet techniques, uh, now is a great time to, to start with a few of those questions. And then we can move on to some ideas on fabrication. Uh, Emily will take care of that. We have one comment from Gil about using the idea of puppetry to tell the story of a life cycle of an organism, which is fantastic. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we often uh, use the life cycle of a butterfly as a great example. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think those shapes could be really effective, you know, taking the, um, taking each portion of the life cycle and creating a simple silhouette 
from each stage uh, would be super effective. Great. Any other ideas anybody wants to share in the chat box before we move on? Well, we can move on. Okay. Um, do we want to, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, uh, some puppet building techniques? Yeah, I've got a quick poll for everybody just to help us um, understand where, where you are in your puppetry construction skills. Oh, we've got another great idea also coming in, uh, ocean creatures. about 10 more seconds on this poll and I'm gonna close it up. Um, Thomas is asking, will there be links and materials available? Yes, you'll get an email with all of that um, at the a whole resource packet with everything, Thomas. All right, here are the results. We've got a lot of new people and some people with some basic knowledge. So, all right, that's where we can go with that. Uh -huh. Did I share those results? Yes, yes. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself again. Okay, let's see. Can everyone hear me? Great. So um, I just wanna talk about some shadow puppet construction tips and tricks um, because uh, we can easily make a simple silhouette um, as an effective shadow puppet, something like this saber-toothed cat that I have here. Um, but you can see this is kind of the movement that you can get with that shadow puppet. So if we want to take it um, and make it a little more complicated, um, not too much, um, but if we want to have some movement with whatever creature we're going to make, um, we'll need to make a jointed shadow puppet. And I'll just be talking a little bit about that. Um, so the materials that you need to make a shadow puppet are included in the packet. I'll just quickly go over them here. Um, cardstock is useful because it's a little bit more durable than regular printer paper, for example. Um, your puppets will hold up a lot longer and they'll be easier to move. Um, so you'll need some cardstock. Cereal boxes work great. Um, any kind of cardstock. Uh, it's kind of sharp looking if you use black cardstock or a dark color, but any any kind of thick paper or cardstock will do. Um, and then just some pencil. A pencil. Uh, if you're marking onto a dark surface, you'll need a light colored pencil. Um, so you can use dowels um, or barbecue skewers um, or sticks that you can find outside uh, as your um, controlling mechanisms. Um, and then you'll need a hole punch um, or some way to poke a hole, small hole um, so you can make your joints. Um, and then tape and scissors to cut out the shapes. Um, okay, so uh, Couple of the tricky parts here are oh, you need to if you're making a jointed shadow puppet you're going to overlap uh, and you can see in these images here you need to overlap the joints um, for example the head and the neck um, of this saber tooth cat and then it's shown here with a brad um, connecting the two pieces but you can also use a piece of yarn. Um, or string and tie knots at either end. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Um, and then to attach the uh, rods um, to control the movement of your puppet, um, an interesting way to do it, an effective way to do it is tape around the end of the rod or stick, close that tape, and then tape the flexible piece uh, at the end to the part of the shadow puppet that you want to control the movement of. Um, and this way you can hold your shadow puppet um, against the screen and have uh, a much more effective way of controlling the movement there. Um, you can also uh, just simply tape a stick to a shape and that will be an effective silhouette if you want to do something a little more simple. 
Um, but this is a good way to do it if you want to really be able to control those movements. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, making a theater um, that you can use at home uh, for your shadow puppets. So you can use a cardboard just from a delivery box, um, or if you have a larger sheet of cardboard, just cut out a hole in the center of it um, and tape some white paper. It could be printer paper if you're gonna make a small screen or if you have some larger butcher paper, you can use that to make a larger screen to have more room to play around with. Um, and then you'll need to make some uh, triangular shapes to stick on the back um, just to hold up your screen. Um, so this is an example of a screen that we made at the Tar Pits um, at an educator workshop we did there. Um, and you can see our story of the artist and the scientist, uh, scientist digging the fossils out of the ground and the artist will be making a model of the saber-toothed cat. Um, you can see the artist there with the paintbrush. So that was the story that we told there. Um, there's some scenery elements. Uh, it's kind of fun to play around with what shapes you can make um, to create a full scene um, and where also they're placed in space will change the size of the shadows uh, that you can make. So yeah, just uh, cardboard and paper. Um, you can also just set up a lamp and have a shadow uh, have a lamp aiming at a wall and and create shadows that way too if you don't have any of those materials on hand. Um, so let's switch to uh, my screen. I'm, is that working? I see you, Becca. Okay, here we go. Um, so I just wanted to show you an example of this theater here. And you can see I have a little feather shape creating a shadow there. So it's kind of fun to play around with other objects as well. So um, one way that you can create a jointed shadow puppet is by starting with a um, gesture drawing. Here's a gesture drawing that I did of our uh, saber tooth cat. It's very simple, just spine shape, rib cage shape, head, pelvis, and then some sticks for the legs and feet. Um, I'm going to move kind of quickly through here, but you'll have all of this in your packet. Um, this is the outline that I then created from that gesture drawing shape. And from there, we need to create some uh, moving parts. So the saber tooth cat is a crouching, pouncing predator. So I decided I would have shoulder um, joints, elbow joints. I wanted a moving head and moving hips as well, but the back feet are in one piece. So the next part is to create a pattern that looks something like this. And this will be in your packet. Um, so in order to get there from here, we need to start cutting out the shapes. So you can see I've cut out this shape here but what I then need to do is fill in right there, fill in the neck shape and where the legs were cut out to make an effective pattern for your puppet um, so that the joints can all overlap. So you end up with this again. And then this needs to be traced out and cut out of cardstock and the holes punched until you have, and I'll pull you guys over here, have this. And you can see in the shadow, and he leaps off screen. <laughs> So there's a good example that's in your packet. You can cut that guy out. Um, you can create your own shapes. You can use any image you find. Uh, another kind of fun thing to do is 
uh, put up an image you find, print out an image from anywhere that you like, put it up against a window and trace that image to create the outline, uh, use the window as a shadow uh, or a light box, sorry. Um, and then cut it out, create whatever pattern you want um, and cut it out of cardstock and make your shadow puppet from there. Um, if anyone has any questions, I went through that uh, a little bit quickly. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to show some of my examples again or, or uh, go over anything in a little more detail. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. Any questions here? We can also, of course, come back and ask some more questions as well. We do have the last 10 minutes reserved for Q&A. So if you don't get your question answered now, we can come back to it. Um, I'm going to go, oh wait, here we've got one question coming in. Yeah, so Thomas is wondering, can we get pointers on controlling the movement? Yeah, so you can see, let me just turn this around here. Oops. Where's my kitty? There he is. Okay, here we go. So I'm holding the puppet flat against the screen and it might be helpful to tape the screen down onto whatever surface you're using so that it doesn't tip forward. Um, I haven't done that, so I'm just going to be gentle. <laughs> um, and I'm using the table top. You can have your puppet move in space or, or you can use the table top um, if your screen goes all the way down to the table. So I'm just doing a simple twisting motion to make the head move here. And this is what's so great about this um, technique of taping the rods on this way. So you put the, the puppet right up against the screen and it just takes a little bit of twisting to make it all happen. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Thomas is also asking, where's the light relative to the puppeteer and the sticks? So it's helpful to have the light um, above and aiming down so that your shadow doesn't interfere with the shadow that you're, you're creating on, on the screen. So um, I, have, I just have my light behind here. But if you can set up a light above and behind and shining kind of down onto the screen, that way your shadow won't get in the way. Great, thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. We'll go to the next section, but if you do have other questions for Emily, we'll, again, we'll have more time for that as well. Um, go back here. Ooh, where's my presentation? Here we go. All right. So before we get into the standards and everything, I'm just curious, everybody's feeling comfort level on integrating the arts into science or other content areas. So I've launched another poll here um, that I'd love to get your responses on. Some basic, not, we have a couple experts, fantastic. I love that. All right, I'll just do another 10 seconds or so on this couple new newbies. That's great. All right, so here are the results. We've got some basic knowledge for the most part, a couple, couple brand new people and a couple experts. So fantastic. Okay, I'm going to kind of quickly review some of the next generation science standards and common core state standards for those classroom connections. Um, Again, this will be something that will have some um, specifics depending on what grade level you're teaching and what content you're covering with, um, with this um, method. But um, for our purposes for next generation science st standards, um, one thing that I really loved was um, the Cal Academy of Art, or excuse me, Cal Academy of Sciences has a um, really great analogy connecting the three pillars of the NGSS to um, baking a cake. 
So if you've taken any of their professional development, you might be familiar with this comparison, but basically what they say is the science and engineering practices are like the baking tools and techniques. So we're thinking about um, developing and using models, we're analyzing and interpreting data, we're engaging in argument from evidence, and we're obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. And those particular subsection ones will again, differ depending on the grade level. So I do encourage you to, to look at that more specifically. Um, the disciplinary core ideas um, would be like the cake, right? Or the batter of, the, of baking your cake. Um, so this can, again, depend on whatever content you're talking about. So we had some examples of looking at the life cycle of an organism. Um, in the lesson plan that you'll receive in the email with the materials, it um, focuses on earth sciences and plate tectonics. So that, again, is something that you can kind of customize to fit your whatever it is you may be teaching. Uh, and then the cross-cutting concepts is like the frosting on the cake, right? Frosting can go with other things. It doesn't have to just go with cake, but it helps to pull a cake together, right? So it's kind of those finishing touches, right? So we're looking at um, cause and effect, um, energy and matter, structure, stru excuse me, structure and function, and stability and change. So those are some of those um, key components that we've pulled that connect here. And then we've got our common core connections. Um, these are the anchor standards for reading and writing um, uh, science, scientific and technical um, subjects. So we've got, um, you know, looking to write arguments to support claims using evidence that can be in the writing of the script for this shadow puppet, whatever they may be acting out. And then we've got um, comprehension and collaboration and in integrating and evaluating information. Uh, as well as presenting, or excuse me, presentation of knowledge and ideas. So we're thinking about how the student is presenting the information that they're finding and how are they supporting that with evidence, right? And that again can be um, written out in the script for this play that they may be doing. Um, and then also looking at how they're making use of strategic um, digital media and visual displays, right? And of course this connects greatly with all of the visual and performing arts standards, which we don't have a slide on because we wanted to focus more on these other standards, but um, those are those standards are also detailed in the lesson plan that's that will be provided. Um, right, so I think we are ready to head into our question and answer session. Um, do we have any that came through here? And actually, I'd love to go through, uh, just go back to one question really quick. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, when you, uh, you, someone asked about uh, light sources and where to put the light source. Uh, and I think the useful way of uh, talking about that is the light is your camera, right? So uh, pro the, the closer the light gets to uh, whatever your subject is, the larger it's going to get in the same way that as a camera moves closer. Uh, also, it's good to remember that everything is reversed, right? So uh, if I have this light source that is tricky to do in this way, right? If I'm facing towards the light, then the image behind me is going to appear in reverse on a projection screen to be facing towards the audience. Uh, so everything is a little, uh, is, is sort of backwards. Uh, you also can think about that light and the camera as being something that can move through space, right? It doesn't have to be static. So if we have this puppet here, uh, let me see if I can get that angle a little better. Sorry, guys, uh, here. So, right, if we go here, right, so like, again, like we can move into one area, we can trace the shape of an object as we go through. Let's see if I can even get this better, huh? Let's right there. Yeah, there we are. So, right, the light can also be something that we can, we can move the light to start here with our alligator and move further away. We can we can find different angles. It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be static. Uh, and but as you look at the light source, you're going to use the most important thing is that you want a single point of light that is as bright as possible. The smaller that light source is, and the uh, stronger it is, the more uh, uh, the clearer the higher the resolution essentially of the images. So. Uh, a flashlight with a single bulb is going to give you something really great. If you use something with multiple light bulbs, right, like a lot of those LED bulbs are going to have a ton of them on there, you're going to get 
you know, a crazy kaleidoscopic, uh, kaleidoscopic image, which, you know, might be something interesting to play with too. Uh, and I just think in general, when, when working with lights, experimenting is always going to be the best option, right? Like just playing around and seeing all the different things you can do. You can have a, if you set up layers of, of objects in front of that light and move the light through it, you're going to get that same, that same uh, image as you would in a film as you move through a space. You can pan, you can, there's a lot of different things you can do with it. Thank you, Eli, for sharing that. Um, it's, yeah, the, the light aspect of it is a whole, whole other thing that's super interesting to experiment with. If you have layers of scenery, like you were just saying, um, and you move the light through that scenery, you can really feel like you're moving through uh, the landscape, which is super fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one other thing that I forgot to mention was, um, if you are connecting your shadow puppets with yarn, um, you just want to tie, I'm just going to show this real quick. You just want to tie the joints. Let me see if I can get a good angle. There we go. There's my overlapping joints with knots at either end. If you don't have brads, this will work too. This is, this is a little sauropodomorph guy that just has a tail movement with the yarn tying the joints. <laughs> there we go. Awesome, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Um, we miss you all too, Emily. Yes. <laughs> Different Emily. <laughs> Great questions. Anything else that you're wondering about, um, perhaps with construction or maybe some other ideas for um, integrating this into uh, other lessons that you may have planned already? No? Oh, here we go. Can, can we share any tips on how to think about engineering movement? How you decided to do that with the saber tooth cat, for example? Yeah, well, what I was talking about doing was I was thinking, so with this cat, so I was thinking about the saber tooth cat and um, what, we, what we know about the saber tooth cat is that it's a crouching and pouncing predator. So it doesn't run like a cheetah after, after an animal. It would crouch and be an ambush, more of an ambush predator. So I thought, how could I make this puppet do that? And part of it is the joints, choosing where the joints are, but part of it is choosing where you want to control the puppet from too. So I knew that I was going to, well, it took some trial and error and figuring it out. So you know, if you're trying to make a puppet, um, probably have to cut out a few different patterns and just test out the movement before you'll hit on the final one. But I knew that I wanted the front legs to be able to crouch. So that's why there's more joints there at the shoulders and the, and the uh, um, <laughs> elbows. <laughs> and then so testing it out, you know, if I use the table as a surface, it takes a little practice, but there's a little crouching position. In order to get that, I need the hips to be able to move and the, the front legs to be able to really bend and crouch. And then I just do a springing motion there. So it's really just thinking about what your creature, what your shape, you know, wants to be doing, and then what joints you're gonna need for that movement. The sauropodomorph, there we go. It's just gonna wag his tail. <laughs> So cute. Yeah. Um, Josephine is wondering if you have tips for um, telling students how to keep their hands and bodies away from the shadow projection. Yeah, you know, I think, first off, I think in, in terms of in puppetry in large, I think, I think sometimes it's best to, to let them be on, uh, on screen. I think, uh, I think a lot of times some of the most interesting things we see are the way that the puppeteer interacts with the puppet. I think uh, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be rigid is, is what I'm saying. Uh, in terms of 
how to teach people how to stay out of the screen, again, I find that it's useful, one, to teach about the quality of light, how light travels, and to talk about how, right, depending on that light source and what that spread is, that, any, that they can look at that light source and they know that if their body is somewhere in the light, they are gonna be projected. Uh, another thing to do that you can do just to make it easier for people is figure out areas that you can block off. So say if you have a light source right here, maybe you build wings, shutters on either side of that light source where your puppeteers are gonna be uh, to help them stay out of the light. Uh, you can get, a, you can, there, there's a lot of, um, but, but it, in general, that's going to have to do with the, the length of the rods you use uh, and the angle of the light, how em, like Emily was talking about. So you can kind of experiment with where that light source is uh, if you're working with uh, a, a, good, a good basic thing to think of is that if the light is higher than them, it's going to be easier for them to stay out of it. If the light is lower, more of their bodies are going to get captured, right? You, you, you want the light to be coming from the opposite direction of where the performance is happening. Great, thank you. Um, I had a question really quickly. Emily, would you say that more joints would be um, helpful in creating more movement for a particular puppet? Is that kind of a rule of thumb? Um, not necessarily. Think about, if you think about it, you only have two hands to, to use to control the movement, right? So I, you can, maybe Eli can speak to some of the more complicated um, puppets that you can, um, get more movements from without just using two points. Uh, but for this cat, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about like, I, I only have two sticks that I'm using, so I can't, if I made, you know, all of these legs, like the back legs, the knees and the feet, and if I put one in the middle, it, it would start to get a little unwieldy. Um, and the, you know, yeah. It, Eli, maybe you can jump in here. And help sure. out. So, so when when you're when you're thinking about how you're going to move something, you've got kind of you've got three main elements, right? You have the movement of the light, right? So you can get an object if you have a, a object that's stationary and you're moving the light across it, you're going to create movement. So you have that way of creating movement. Then you have the mechanical movement. That's the rods of the puppet, right? So, for example, with this guy, right? I've got this. This is my mechanism there to make the mouth open and close right? Uh, so that's the mechanical part. In the case of the cat, that's the rods going off of it. Uh, and then finally, you just have the movement coming from the puppeteer. So, right, if my hand is a fish and it has no rods on it and I'm moving it like this, I'm going to get that kind of quality of movement. If I'm trying to create something that's uh, flying, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that all these parts are moving. It can just be that, right, we, we look at, like, what the main thing. So if this was a bird, right, if my I used to do this when I was a, when I was a younger puppeteer. I like to put wings on the tips of my fingers and a head here, little claws, and then I'd make little birds, right? And so again, like this, this is right when we have a puppet. If we're imagining my hand as a puppet, and you're thinking about the mechanisms, the obvious place to go is, oh, I'm going to have all of these parts move. But a lot of the times, the best part of it is all the other things, right? Like as you create the illusion of physics, you say this bird coming down and that pushes off and like talking about how physics informs that how it, you know creating a, an illusion of inertia creating an illusion of weight in the puppet thinking about what the main again that the, the economy of movement so the more joints you have the more individual mechanical elements your puppeteer is going to have to control uh and and in in doing that and adding complexity you often will make the puppet move uh less realistically for example because to manage all of those different mechanical parts is going to be more difficult to get to a, a point that you know you're happy with. I mean, that being said, I have a few other little mechanisms here, uh, and also in terms of making things, right? Uh, so, like, you can see this is like just covered in holes, right? And that's because as I was figuring out where I wanted to put, this is like a wing mechanism. As I was looking at where I wanted to put these bolts, I just cut, I just put as many holes as I could so I could play around with. Uh, how those different positions would affect it. Uh, I also have this little guy. So this is like a shadow thing uh, for something and it doesn't work. It's meant for a projector, but you can get the idea that, right, I, I've just made a mechanical thing element to help me get the movement I want because I wasn't going to move all of those little uh, leaves on this iris individually. 
So I built a, sim a simple paper mechanism uh, controlling all of them so that I could create this kind of little iris effect, right? Uh, that is so strange doing this here. Anyways, I, I hope that it explains a little something, right? And then you get this nice little, uh, this little move. <laughs> um, so you can look at different ways of like different, at, you know, different angles to approach how you're going to get movement. That's awesome. I see so many connection points for so many different topics. Um, and I think, I hope our teachers paint it, you know, zooming in here also see some of that as well. Um, yes, Thomas is saying paper engineering is a skill that's also used in pop-up books, for instance. Yes, yes. Another great, another great connection there for us. So fantastic. Um, I'm going to just share before we wrap up my last slide here so that um, we can get all this information out. So if you do have any other questions, please throw them up now. Um, we're going to we're going to wrap this up so we can respect all of your time. But thank you, Emily and Eli. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise um, and your amazing skill in puppetry. It's, it's always so fun to see and chat with you about this. Um, if you have other questions, you can contact the Tar Pit School Programs team at schoolprograms at tarpits.org. And um, you can also share your shadow puppets with us. You can tag us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, and you can use the hashtag MindBlownLA. We'd love to see what you and your students create. Um, and let me just make sure we don't have any other questions before we sign out. I see a few more messages. Yes. Oh, lots of thank yous. Thank you all also for joining us. Um, we really thank hope you. to see you all in the museum in person soon. Stay healthy, stay safe. Um, thank you all again and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>